I'm so excited to have you all uh, this morning. We've got a great program, but I've got a, a co-host with me today. So I'm excited to tag team with Daniela Perry, Vice President at the Georgia Chamber. So she and I will be working together. Before I introduce our speakers, um, just want to let you know that we this is a meeting format for this one. We want it to be very conversational. That doesn't mean unmute and just talk all willy-nilly, though. So um, please, if you've got a question that you would like to ask, please either just say you want to ask a question in the chat box and then Daniela will be keeping an eye on the chat box or she can pose the question for you or do I think the raise your hand function is working as well. So either of those options, we're trying to, to keep the talking over one of each over each other as minimal as possible, but we're hoping for a lively and engaging conversation today. Um, so with that, I will introduce our speakers and kick it off. Um, today we've got Dr. Barbara Wall. She is um, Director for uh, CTAE Career Technical Agricultural Education at Georgia Department <laughs> um, of Education, and then Dr. Ken Zeff, who is the Executive Director for Learn for Life. I know that we've got a lot of people very familiar with this area, but just for those that may not be as familiar with the nuances of like CTAE and Learn for Life, if you could both just give a short little um, overview of those two areas, that would be fabulous to get us started today. Okay. Um, all right, I'll start first. Uh, career tech and ag education in Georgia is uh, the new transformation of uh, vocational education. You know, some people think that vocational education has been removed from the schools. It's not. It's been improved and it's new and it's different. It's better. It serves more students. Uh, and it's now known career tech and ag education. Every school system in Georgia receives Perkins funds and have some type of career tech and ag programs. And um, over 67% of our students uh, in Georgia at our high schools participate in at least taking one career tech and ag education course. We try to align our courses with the business and industry needs across Georgia and offer pathways that are in demand. Thank you, Barbara. Ken. Well, thanks, Amy, and hey, pr pleasure to be with, uh, with our good friends at Max. Uh, you guys are doing the hard work out there of keeping uh if we're focused on k-12 and and higher ed you guys are getting folks working and and that i'm, I'm I, th I think it's great that this organization and this group of folks is, is trying to dive down deeper into education because that's that that's that whole cradle and career pipeline which is really what learn for life is all about uh learn for life is a partnership of the five counties gwinnett DeKalb, cobb clayton and fulton uh and eight school systems within that that five counties which uh, represents about six hundred thousand kids which is about a third of the kids in the state of georgia uh, it's a partnership of the leaders of those districts and some CEOs, uh, both civic and um, uh, for-profit for business, uh, coming together. And really, it's an asset-based model, trying to find out what's working within Metro Atlanta around the, this cradle-to-career pipeline, uh, and then trying to lift that up and, and take those things to scale. So we organize around six key milestones, uh, kindergarten readiness, third grade reading, eighth grade math high school graduation, post-secondary uh, enrollment and completion. We've got groups of folks that are meeting every couple weeks on each of those topics, looking at data, trying to figure out what's working and how we can take that back to our leadership council, which is our superintendents and other, uh, other uh, leaders in Metro Atlanta and try and take those things to scale. So we've, uh, like everybody else, everything, you know, that's, that's what we're, that's what's in, that's what's on paper, that's what we work on, but everything is about, uh, it's about COVID and uh, re-entry process these days and I'm sure that's what we're gonna I'm sure that's gonna springboard us into the conversation. Great segue Ken. Um, so there has been it seems like the, the one thing with COVID there is constant change we like we get new data we get new information we get new understanding and it's it, talk about being agile like this is the epitome of operating in an agile environment or, or being forced to be agile and so I want to like first like this is really all about the kids so how, I want to talk about the kids first, the impact on the kids, but then all, then the system, like, right? Like, what has this impact been on the kids? How is it the short-term and the long-term impact? And that's to both you and um, Barbara. Okay. Um, of course, our kids are the most important uh, focus here. 
Um, I think that there's, there's good and bad that's going on with COVID-19. When we think about our students, we're really concerned, you know, about the students that um, may live in uh, home situations that are a little less than desirable. And by not being at school, you know, maybe that they may have some issues that, um, that could be addressed uh, from a caring adult at a school, uh, but some of them are still at home and just in that environment and it's hard to see what's going on there. Um, we've got some of our students that uh, are really stepping up to the plate. I've heard some of the comments from teachers that students are really being uh, more cooperative than ever. They're excited about being back at school, being with their peers, uh, you know, being able to see some of their, uh, their friends that they've missed out on. Uh, the social impact, though, is, um, is, is real, I think, for these students. Even though they're back at school, um, within the cafeteria environment, many times they are not able to socialize like they had been in the past. So, you know, that, that creates, you know, uh, some extra, um, extra stress, I guess, on a student. It, it's different. It's not the norm that they've been accustomed to. Um, I know that, you know, we're very concerned about some students getting behind. We've got some initiatives that are in place to help address um, those situations. Some of these are done locally at the, uh, the systems themselves. We've got some uh, resources out for all of our schools to uh, take a look at what's going on with the students. What have they learned? What do they need to uh, be uh, remediated on? You know, this type of thing. But, uh, you know, we, we've got to listen to these students and really stay in tune with, with what's going on so that we can address their needs. Ken, are you seeing any in the Learn for Life Network, um, this social and emotional component of learning, right? Like when we talk about soft skills, we harp on soft skills and there's a lot of pressure on education to really develop that. Are you seeing um, some of the some imp new implementations and innovation in your network to kind of address some of this? Yeah, and, and I think Barbara said right. I mean, the, the kids are going through a lot, and, and staying connected with them is right. There's kind of you know before before you can get to remediation, you got to understand what kids are going through. And I think there's kind of two ways that we see it. There's kind of the scene, you know, with the visual uh, manifestations of of of, the, of what's happening right now, and the unseen piece. And the scene piece is you know as far as student achievement, we we know that uh, you know kids, you know, March 13th, everyone kind of knows where they were when the uh, when the president said you know. The world's you know we're, we're stopping flights so everything shut down and everyone's like oh this is this is this is for real uh governor Kemp shortly after did the right thing shut schools down uh through uh through the end of the year kids lost about 10 weeks of instruction at that point that uh we we commissioned a study along with our friends at redefine ed and tried to figure out what the impact to students in metro atlanta was because they missed that the, that 10 weeks of instruction uh, because we didn't administer Georgia milestone, which is generally how we know how we know those things, and it looks like uh, uh, about twenty one thousand kids slipped below the proficiency line in English, and about twenty eight thousand kids uh, of the six hundred thousand kids in in Metro Atlanta slipped below the line in math. And so, what what that loss of instruction meant about a year's worth of progress that was going to be made in those last few months, uh, and then combined with the summer learning loss. Kids have, kids have lost a ton of ground. And so we, we, have to, we have to understand that kids are starting at a place that um, is behind from where, they started, from where they started last year. Then you combine that with, uh, with the lack of, you know, I think the state superintendent said it wasn't really distance learning, it was more emergency learning. Uh, and so we, you know, districts weren't ready for, no one had really envisioned this sort of uh, crisis teaching mode. The longest we'd had, you know, 2014 Snowmageddon, where it was a week and everyone said, this will never happen again. This is a once in a generation uh, snowstorm. And here we are like moving to this full time. So I think that's the scene piece is the student achievement piece. Uh, the, um, you know, we, we know but only about 80% of kids and any given day are logging in. Uh, which is, you know, normally attendance is 96, 97%, and so we're only in 80%. Uh, so we know that kids are, and we know which kids those are, right? Those are the kids that were already behind that are falling further behind. Then the unseen piece that, that you referred to, Amy, I think is, is uh, we really have to take that holistic, you know, it's not just that kids are missing instruction. Unemployment is, is, is through the roof. Food insecurity has been exposed. Parents are under a lot of stress. Uh, you know, in, in a time when we need each other, you know, in a time when we look for support, uh, all we're told to is isolate. And so those unseen impacts on kids, uh, that takes a toll. 
that takes a toll on their mental health. And I think we're still figuring out what the ramifications of that are. Uh, there's a, a study that just came out uh, last week that says obesity is, is going to be a, something we're going to be all talking about uh, in the next few months for kids, that this lack of activity. And that's just, you know, one thin thread of, uh, of the impact. Uh, it's really, so to your answer, is, your, your question was, so <laughs> that's great. We know there's a lot of that stuff. What, what's happening out there? What kind of innovations are we seeing? And, and with the organizations and nonprofits that are, are, seem to be having the most success are those that are running through walls to find kids. Uh, there's all these obstacles that are keeping us from, uh, from staying connected to kids. The, the nonprofits, school systems, guidance counselors, uh, school, uh, parent aides that are, that are not being deterred and finding kids, connecting with kids, uh, either, uh, you know, at, at any of these inflection points, especially, you know, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about post-secondary later about that transition and, and the need there. But uh, we've seen, uh, um, I was just talking to somebody at College of Eisenhower, you know, texting kids every day, uh, uh, scheduling virtual hangouts, um, doing things, meeting kids where they are, setting TikToks to each other, having contests around TikToks, you know, however it is to get kids connected. Uh, the, the, all they hear is stay away from each other. Uh, and so we have to find a way to, to keep people engaged and connected during these, during these really difficult times. So what do you, both to you and Barbara, uh, like there's just cascading challenges that come from this, right? And I, I guess some of the Pollyanna side of me just wants to think, okay, when we can all go back to school like normal, everything will be fine. And But I feel like there's going to be some long-term ramifications for the kids that that's not a realistic expectation. And I, you may not be able to, to quantify that or anything, but just your gut instincts on what are some of those challenges, even when we're back to what we used to consider normal, um, will it will it be normal? Will there be extra demand on the teachers to to manage some things that they were already, you know, had a lot on their plate before? Any any thoughts? I think uh, you know when we go back, it's not going to be exactly like it was. I think uh, you know experience in COVID gives us uh, several opportunities to look at innovation. You know, how can we do things differently? I think when it comes specifically to our teachers, I think, you know, now's the time to think about, um, you know, what are they dealing with that they really need help with? And one of the big uh, issues we hear from our teachers is this virtual learning uh, with career tech and ag education, especially. That's really difficult to do with hands-on classes. Um, but even, um, you know, if you go beyond just trying to figure out just virtual learning, uh, even if it's not the hands-on approach, uh, that's probably something that we need to talk with our um, educational counterparts at the college that provides our teacher education programs and make sure that that's included in the teacher education programs. Uh, you know, how to plan lessons for uh, virtual environments, how to conduct those virtual lessons. Our teachers have learned a lot uh, by necessity in a very short time when it comes to uh, virtual teaching. Um, one, one issue that our teachers are really struggling with when it comes to virtual uh, teaching is some of them, um, it's as if they have their um, schedules tripled. Uh, instead of just teaching a class face-to-face, -face, they're teaching a class face-to-face, -face, but that same class, some other students of the class are connecting virtually. Some of them are doing hybrid where they come in sometimes and they do uh, virtual uh, learning others. So, you know, juggling all of those balls is really um, a pretty stressful for our teachers. Yeah, I can't imagine. I get stressed out when I have too many windows open on my computer <laughs> and can't navigate. So I cannot imagine trying to navigate in-person teaching, online teaching, and then a mixture of both. Um, Amy, you mentioned uh, employability skills a few minutes ago, and we know how important those are to our employers. Uh, it's been interesting. We've got quite a few resources on employability skills for our teachers to use uh, with the students, um, but we've had a lot of focus on employability skills uh, during this COVID. That's something that can be taught um, a little easier than teaching someone how to weld uh, in a virtual environment. So uh, we are seeing uh, more interest and more um, more uh, excitement in that employability skills uh, teaching component too. Well, that's a, I want to, before we kind of switch to the system level, I'd like to 
just check with Daniela. Do we have any questions in the chat box, Daniela, that we need to address before we kind of pivot a little bit? Hey, yeah, thanks, Amy. We have a question from Donna Robinson about um, vocational programs and how parents find more information. I know Dr. Wall shared some resources about where you can find more information about what programs are offered, but Dr. Wall, maybe could you talk about kind of how students are kind of navigating remote learning while still figuring out maybe what kind of career path they're thinking long term and how they might find out about CTAE programs um, during COVID and, and how their parents can be part of the process and kind of start thinking about this strategically about what their career goals are long term. Okay, uh, a few years ago, we did a um, cooperative uh, project with the Technical College and that is Youth Science. Many of you may have heard of Youth Science. This is a, a, a virtual assessment program. It's, um, oh gosh, um, we, we provide this to all middle and high school students so that they can look at their different um, abilities. Uh, there is an interest as well as an aptitude assessment to look at their strong points and you know, what are they good at, what careers fit there. Uh, this is a great time, uh, and many of our schools are choosing the uh, time that we've had during COVID to really focus on that youth science piece. We've had more students to log on, take a look at their profiles, and try to align um, their uh, aptitude with the career pathways that are offered in Georgia. And our whole mission is to get students ready for the workforce whenever that is, whether it's right after high school when they enter a career, or uh, if it's a few years later when they enter the technical college, or even if it's longer uh, when they go into the university system and uh, even military uh, and uh, registered apprenticeship programs. So whatever we can do to help students get ready for that career uh, is what we're trying to do. Dr. Wall, our but CTAE programs are in all of the public high schools, is that correct? That is correct. They may be in the form of, um, you know, at their traditional high schools, or some of them may be located uh, at their career academy, uh, or maybe a mixture. Some may be at the high school, some at the career academy as well. Perfect. Danielle, anything, anything else? Are we caught up on questions for the time being? We're caught up for now. Thanks, Amy. Perfect. So I want to kind of pivot over to the systems and Dr. Wall, you were already kind of talking about some of that and Ken, I'd love kind of more at the local level too. What have been some of the biggest changes that have been to be implemented? I know online learning is obviously one of them, but, but that's just kind of like, okay, that's just a small piece. Like it's a big piece, but that's just, how does that trickle out? I think there's there's two things that I would I would uh, I mean there's so many but there's two I, I think are, are worth focusing on. Uh, it, it's when we talk about digital learning, there's the the curriculum piece, but the 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 technology piece and the device and Wi-Fi access is something that I think we're coming to grips with over the past six months. As uh, you know, that's we would never say. And I think we'll come out of this in a better place than where we started. But we would never say to kids, uh, well, we can't afford textbooks for every kid. So some kids get textbooks and then, you know, some of you go buy them on, on the side. Like, it, it, you know, the, I, th I think the device and the Wi-Fi access are going to be the new textbook. And so we will, uh, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to take a little time. It's going to take political will. It's going to take, you know, some agitation from folks on this call too. But recognizing that uh, Wi-Fi, that if you don't have Wi-Fi and universal access to the, to the internet, uh, it's hard to partic participate in, in not just learning, but in so many aspects of, you know, of, of our society. And I think that's really been exposed during this process, uh, during, during these past six months, that it is a non-negotiable. I mean, we, we just can't, we cannot move forward. And it's not, and it really does take government, at least the Wi-Fi piece. This is going to be a hard thing. You know, we have some partnership with the private sector, and there have been some good, good examples, Comcast and AT&T, each, each coming up with different sort of a patchwork uh, from their corner of the, of the universe. And that's been helpful, uh, but it's not enough. And, you, you know, it shouldn't have to be Marietta City Schools driving buses that are Wi-Fi enabled to apartment complexes so kids can get their, to, to can log in and get into the Remind app to find out what their homework is for the day. Uh, that that's I think we're going to come out. I think we're re recognizing that. And I think we're going to come out of that in a different place. Uh, the other piece is um, it's also become increasingly clear, and I know people on the call feel this too. That you know, K twelve is is the de facto child care provider in this country, or certainly in Atlanta. And and if we don't have a child care solution, uh, I see Tim Carroll on the call too from from the chamber. I know it's something the chamber is thinking a lot about. If if we don't have 
if we if we don't have a solution for parents to get plugged into support for their their child, especially at those you know that K five those those early grades, uh, it's going to be hard for us to get into talk about economic recovery. Uh, it, it's going to be let alone education of that child, but just even the broader economy. And so we need to start thinking about uh, you know how, how we solve this problem. And, and, and you know, to your question about solutions, we are seeing some in, some companies doing some things. We know BlackRock is is working on subsidized childcare. Truist is doing some work around this, around uh, creating options for parents and creating flexibility for parents uh, who because you know this this thing's not going away overnight, right? Uh, providing flexibility for parents to either bring their child to work or to stay at home and provide care for their child there. But we, we need solutions here that can be taken to scale because uh, we're not going to be able to move forward until we solve the child care issue. Yeah, totally. Um, and it will, it will take a lot of people working <laughs> together <laughs> on that. Dr. Wall, what about the, the biggest changes from your perspective? You alluded to some of those just trying to teach, you know, hands-on type of welding thing in a virtual environment. What are the, some of the other biggest challenges you've seen just through the CTAE lens? Through career tech and ag education, we know that we cannot accomplish all that we need to accomplish and really have our students ready for the workforce if we work in isolation. So a big part of what we do is to work with business and industry. Well, business and industry's environment looks a whole lot different right now. So one of our challenges is our work-based learning program uh, and placing students out there in the workforce. We've had some business and industries that have said, we need to step back and not have your students come in right now. Um, but then we've had some businesses that have really uh, been innovative. They've really thought outside of the box. Um, businesses like uh, Win Tech up in Marietta, they've done a great job doing some virtual work-based learning internships uh, to where uh, the students uh, over a 15-day period, a certain hour of the day, they log in, they hear from industry professionals, and they not only hear from industry professionals at WinTech, they're hearing from industry professionals all over the country. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's great uh, opportunities. You know, if they were just going into a business, they may not be able to hear from and actually uh, have some discussions with uh, a, a wide array of business partners. Um, with that particular program, uh, they are doing uh, a session where parents can log in and ask some questions too to some of those business and industry folks. And uh, you know, th this helps with um, uh, giving students exposure to business people, um, which is uh, so critical. Um, so, you know, focusing on placing our students in job environments where they can meet with business and industry is a little challenging, but there are ways around that. Uh, we do mock interviews in a lot of our schools where we're getting our students accustomed to the interview process. Uh, we're seeing uh, many groups doing that online now. Um, we at the department uh, are doing our interviews uh, virtually. That's something I've been totally against until now. Um, but, uh, you know, it's with every challenge that's out there, there's some type of solution. Um, it, it's really hard. Uh, another challenge that's really hard is uh, providing um, lab experiences for our students when they're uh, in a virtual learning environment. Uh, what some schools have done to uh, help with this is they provide some take-home kits that kids can come by, they pick up a kit, like in our culinary arts class, there may be a mix and bowl and some ingredients and uh, different things like that that they can take home and uh, you know, have the lesson online and then uh, create uh, whatever food and nutrition uh, recipe is required of that experience. They are doing the same thing in some of the construction classes, small kits for small projects. Engineering is, is doing some of these same types of things as well as healthcare. So, um, you know, um, so where, it, where we've got challenges, we're finding solutions. So it sounds like, I mean, it, there are, it can't all be bad, right? There are some positive <laughs> outcomes. And, and just as a, a person who's been pushing work-based learning experiences and how do we grow the access to these experiences, do you think, it, it sounds like some of it is pivoting to virtual, which I think in rural areas is even more important if, you know, like if kids don't have access to transportation, just getting to the to the experience um, on a job site can be the first hurdle, right? Similar to the technology and the digital access challenges we talked about earlier, but 
do you see that what other positive things do you think that that will help enable skate to scale these opportunities since they can't some of them i know it's not ideal but i think in the work-based learning spectrum to have something of an exposure and an experience is we better than really that. we strongly believe in work-based learning and know that in order for our students to really experience a workforce a work-based learning placement is is ideal but we also understand the restrictions in especially rural Georgia with a few opportunities there we understand the transportation problems that you mentioned there uh, as well, Amy. And uh, as we've talked about, increasing the opportunities of work-based learning, especially in rural Georgia, um, you, you know, this has given us, and, we, we, and we've done this for several years, we, we've been struggling with rural Georgia and how to get those opportunities expanded. I mean, we even believe in this so much that we selected work-based learning uh, as a uh, core indicator to be measured by when it comes to quality uh, career tech programs, but yet we understood the challenges in rural Georgia. So, you know, having to experience this uh, through COVID, we see that there are some uh, answers out there that can help. Uh, the uh, online learning, uh, work-based learning placements, we've got some business people that now are allowing uh, their students to uh, do some of their um, business work at home and uh, turn those projects in. Uh, just like us, we're doing more teleworking, uh, like many of you are, and even after COVID is over, uh, many folks in our uh, Department of Education will be teleworking. We have uh, cut from five floors down to two, uh, so our footprint is much smaller at Twin Towers. So, you know, all these options have been available, but until we were forced into doing some of these things, well, I'm not sure we really considered them as true solutions. But I, I think, uh, you know, this is definitely one way to expand work-based learning um, is to do some virtual experiences. I, I, I would add, I think, I think, I think Dr. Wall's assessment is right that, that there are some exciting opportunities that are emerging the you know although we're we're in difficult economic straits there are some companies that are doing quite well now right i mean there there is you know obviously hospitality is struggling but but uh amazon logistics all the technology providers are doing quite well uh, this is a real opportunity for companies to take leadership roles especially with you know when i think about our technical our technical college system you know it's just like Gwinnett tech uh i guess right, right before the pandemic and the, the work that they're doing around with automotive, like building the automotive base within, you know, the technical college system so they can see, so kids can have those experiences, same with um, uh, healthcare, you know, th those happen because business comes and says, you know, the, the, at, 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 I was thinking about the automotive bay. It was, uh, I believe it was, um, it was uh, Mercedes Benz that had their, their work, their, their, the, the, the lab that was at Gwinnett Tech looked just like the lab at the, or just like the, the repair shops that they have in their facilities. So kids get trained there, they go right into this work and it's, it's a seamless transition. It's great. It's great for everybody. Uh, that's because of business leadership. And so businesses need to take the lead and figure out how they can replicate what they need and, and use the resources at, at, at either at the TCSG or, or uh, CTAE and really drive, uh, and really drive, instead, of, it's going to be hard for, for the bottom up to, to drive this because no one's as nimble as the folks on the front line in, in the business community. And so, especially folks on this call that are connected to, uh, to those career opportunities and those, those successful operations, reaching out and, and getting plugged into the technical colleges to CTE of here's what we need, you know, here's, here's the type of environments that kids will be in and trying to simulate those uh, in those, in those uh, experiences for kids early on is going to prepare kids for later for, for when they transition. Because look, as, as dark as it is at times right now, it's going to pass, you know, we're going to be on to the next thing. And the companies that are, are building that pipeline now will reap those rewards later on. So I want to go back here. Um, I'm sorry. Barbara, yeah, just it's Melvin Everson with Gwinnett Tech. Thank you so much for <laughs> mentioning Gwinnett Tech because you're exactly right. Mercedes Benz came to us yeah. and built that lab out there and got exactly what they have. So the students will come here and learn firsthand with modern technology uh, here at Gwinnett Tech. And that's a great example of that. And it has been so successful. Great. And, and Glenn, Glenn Cannon took me around and showed me and he, yes. his eyes were, his eyes were big. <laughs> and he, he's proud because he knows, I mean, this is works for everybody, right? It works for yeah. the co company and kids are getting 
so many times we lose kids, you know, uh, along the way because they're like, what, what, where's the relevance? How, how, is, how is this, that's why you science is so important. You know, it, it shows kids that connection. By getting kids, you know, to roll up their sleeves and get to work, and in, 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 uh, and these are good jobs. These are these are not, you know, these are these are not uh, low-paying jobs. They actually, get these are careers that kids are building. So, yeah. I salute you, Melvin, and uh, the, the work you guys are doing at Glenn Tech. Uh, so I want to go back to one comment that you were um, making, Ken, about this will pass, right? But there, I think that there's also, uh, yes, I hope so. But I think that this um, moment has given us an opportunity to, I don't, we can't let this, there's an opportunity here that we can't let go by, right? So really understanding the disparities that are, um, affecting the kids, especially in low-income, underserved areas, and, um, sorry, I'm distracted. <laughs> um, the, uh, Melvin, can you put your phone <laughs> on mute, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, like, there's a huge opportunity, and we talked about this before, about some of the challenges, and it seems like there's a lot more awareness, and we can't let that go, right? We have to, like, the, the work-based learning piece was it's critical before, it's critical now, it's going to be critical in the future, but there are some pieces right now when we look at um, equity and inclusion that we really need to harness this moment to, to to really make an impact long term and, and not saying that going back to the way it was before um, pre COVID is not good enough. So what are some of these pieces where you think that we can really harness the, the, the people are more aware now and, and we can move forward. I know this wasn't one of the questions we talked about previously. But <laughs> I, I would just love some insight on we, we can't let this, we can't let this go by without really forcing some major change to happen. Well, I think, uh, you know, the lack of high speed internet access we've known about, but this really puts it in our face uh, to see, you know, what, what it's truly like. Back in May, uh, we um, did a survey with all of our schools throughout Georgia, and we estimated that there's 80,000 student households in the state that do not have access to wireless services that's a lot, uh, and, and that's a big deal. Um, you know, since that time, we've been working very diligently um, with, um, with a lot of different businesses and industries to try to help solve these problems. And, uh, and, and we have uh, helped, you know, with some of these, we've, we've gotten the CARES Act money that's been able to help fund some of this project. Our business and industry folks across Georgia have really stepped up to the plate to make some of these opportunities available. And there's a lot of people working together throughout the state um, to address that. Uh, it, it is a big deal and we must continue our efforts. And if COVID goes away tomorrow, we can't stop with those efforts. But um, I think it, we needed something like this to prod us a little more as a state to um, make those changes. I, I would just add, I mean, the, and I, you, may, you alluded to it at the beginning, Amy, the, the opportunity gap uh, in Georgia and really nationwide, specifically in Atlanta, it was here before, you know, COVID-19 hit. Like, it, was, it wasn't like uh, we were humming along. Uh, we're still, you know, before COVID-19 hit, we are 20, 30 points. Uh, subgroup gap between kids of you know white kids and and and, and minority kids or traditionally underserved groups, uh, and so this has further exposed that you know one 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 thing that once one thing that's really been interesting to watch is as there's been these in, as schools are starting to think about returning, and districts are sending out. Uh, letters or intent forms our parents want to send their their children back and this is going on nationwide it's about two to one low income especially black and brown kids families are choosing not to go in not to send their kid back and you think well why is that why would that you you might you might have guessed it would be the opposite right it might be that that those are families that want to get their their kids uh plugged back in and what what uh researchers are saying is a lack of trust it's a lack of of, of feeling that their child is going to be taken care of and when their child comes back, and if their child should get sick, the lack of faith in the healthcare system. I mean, this 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 endemic challenges that we have, and you know, we see the we see it as as the, the social unrest in the streets. We see it it's manifest in the schools. 
this is something that we have to, if we're really going to address these challenges, we got to get at the core of this. And so it is a painful time to have these conversations, this reckoning that's happening, but we cannot take our foot off the gas. We need to continue to, to recognize the, the history that, that brought us to this moment and make and, and, and provide, use that as a lens for the investments we make going forward because the status quo was not working. It was not working for a lot of kids. Uh, and this, this, this situation just ex uh, makes it even more acute. And so until we, until we can show that we're doing specific outreach, specific programs, specific investments to help change the trajectory, uh, and this, you know, again, this is, this is bigger than education. Uh, this is criminal justice. This is uh, food insecurity. This is uh, employment. But I think this is, you know, the, the Amer America's about a journey, right? We're not going to get there uh, over time. We can get into this hole in a minute. It's going to take us more than a minute to get out of it. But we have to keep, I, I hope, and this is uh, to echo uh, Barbara's comments, that we continue to, to work and, and struggle with this and not just when we go back say, okay, now we can go back to the old status quo because we have to recognize the status quo is not working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, so this kind of leads to my next question. And again, if you've got any questions from the audience, if you want to type your question in, we'll address it that way. Or if you just want to say, I have a question and it shows your name, then we can call on you um, too. But this, the disparity, right? The way we measure that is through testing. And so where does that put us? Like, I know it's like the last thing you want to add is another burden, right? Like we're doing so much critical care and education right now, but without the testing that leaves us in the dark and that's a scary place to be, um, especially for these kids. Right. So talk to me a little bit about that, that challenge and what you're hoping to see or scared you might see. I think there's a time and a place for testing. Uh, right now, during the middle of COVID, what we are focusing on at the Department of Education is care over compliance. Um, you know, we, we've got to care for these students and these teachers and, and do what we can to make it through this, uh, this uh, critical time. Um, and, but we don't need to beat them over the head with tests. Now's not the time to test students. Uh, when you test students, you're also evaluating the teachers. Uh, and placing some extra, extra stress there. I know that um, you probably have heard from Superintendent Woods, his stand on uh, testing. Uh, we do too many tests uh, and we, we've got to get away from that. And that's one thing when we get back to the new normal, we don't want to get back to as much focus as there was on uh, so many different tests. Now, yes, we've got to have some tests in place for some checks and balances to see where our students are, to see where the teachers are. But the magnitude that we had was just, was just way out of kilter. And that's not a place we plan to go back to. So I'll, I'll I, I, so if you want, I, I have a, a slightly different, a different assessment of this. I mean, I think, I, I, I agree assessment is a pendulum right and so we there was a time when i think we were over testing kids i think there was broad assessment especially i think what and what drives parents crazy and drives educators crazy is when we take the assessment and then nothing it doesn't really do, go anywhere it's just it just we get the results back three months later and, and it's like what was the point we took all this time nothing gets accomplished and so i think that was a challenge i think what we eventually we have to arrive at this place i think that we separate assessment from accountability uh, I think you can you can assess a student to understand where they are without saying teacher you're bad student you're bad, but if, if we if we if we decide to not assess kids and understand and and it's not that's not an easy thing to do is separate assessment from accountability. So I, I don't mean to to you know too too often these things fall into the wrong hands and are misinterpreted. And so I don't want to just you know shrug and say well that's an easy thing to do. It can be a hard thing to do, but and if we don't know where kids are then it's hard to, 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 to put resources uh, directed to the right places. It's hard to lift up the practices that are working. Uh, we have to get away from a deficit mentality. I think, that, I think that's where the state superintendent is talking about, and I agree with that philosophically. I just think about the execution of it, that to say um, we don't want to know. We don't want to know what these results are, and we don't have time to assess kids. I mean, I just... I wonder what we, uh, if we're trying to do personalized learning, if we're trying to direct resources without knowing where kids are. I know if I went to the doctor's office, I would want him to take my temperature and look into, you know, listen to my heartbeat. I don't necessarily need a colonoscopy every time I go in. That, that's maybe a bridge too far. 
but you do need some information to know where kids are. And good teachers are doing this all the time. We know they're, they're regularly assessing kids through formative assessments and, and checks for understanding. Uh, I, it, I think where the state board arrived at this 10%, uh, you know, that was their recommendation. We'll see if that, if that carries the day. It, it, the feds have, have, pretty, have, have dug in their heels and said, we're not going to let accountability go away. And I just, I, I, just, uh, I just think before No Child Left Behind, when we didn't have information, the kids that end up losing are the kids who, are, uh, who, traditionally, who traditionally lose. And so uh, I would just want to... I'd want to know what our plan is to know how those kids are doing and not, and they don't get left behind. So I, I think it's an evolving topic. I think we all agree. We don't, we, we want to decrease the pressure. And so can we do that uh, and, and, and still get the information? I think that's the open question for me. Yeah. We're looking at more formative type assessments, like you mentioned, Ken. You know, the high stakes tests are these summative assessments where either you've learned it all at the end here, you're tested, um, or, or you haven't learned anything. So, you know, more formative assessments um, is, is what uh, we're advocating. And I, cer I certainly would agree that teachers should not be held accountable. Uh, it, you know, I think there's, this, there's also, I think there's a, a little bit of, of misunderstanding the public. It's not like any, any teacher is held 100% accountable by their, by their standardized test score. That's just, not, that's just not how it works. I mean, it could be up to a quarter, maybe a third of their evaluation uh, is, 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 in, the, in, the, in the traditional days. So I think teachers should not be held accountable for standardized test scores, but, that, but there, I, to me, that doesn't, I'd still like to get that information. And, and formative assessments can work. I know the state has been rolling out a system. Uh, if there's a way for us to get a good assessment of where kids are, I think that's where, where, where I'd like to see us land. Mm -hmm. I see a question in the text box from uh, Anita Lee. She says, if, if uh, we are trying to do personalized learning, then why can't we do personalized testing? Um, we're working on uh, multiple diploma options um, at the department. And what you will see when that is rolled out is that we're looking at uh, students uh, achieving, graduating from high school in many different ways. And those different ways are aligned to different types of testing. Uh, for some, you know, it may be the SAT or the ACT. The other ones, it may be a, an industry credential. Uh, for others, it um, could be uh, whatever is dictated by the next level of education that the student is going to, to achieve. So be on the lookout for some new and different things uh, to um, be shared with Georgia um, folks uh, from our superintendent uh, in this area. And, and I would just add that, you know, Marietta and um, I think Putnam County, and there's some innovative testing going on out there to try and get at that. And I think that's great. I think we definitely, you know, the, the, we should not think that this big stick called Georgia Milestones is the only way to understand how kids are doing. I, 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 I think everybody would agree with that. You know, you, you, you want to make sure there's rigor. You want to make sure there's, it's, it's, it can be norm referenced, which means that we can compare it to how kids are doing uh, elsewhere. Uh, so I think, I think that, and the state has done a good job in taking leadership in, in these pilots. And I think, uh, I, I think, I think to, to Barbara's point, more is coming. Uh, and I think, I just think the answer should be like you just, like the question, the question addresses, uh, how do we get it better? Not how do we run, how do we not do it? And so I think that as long as we're asking that question, I think we'll arrive at a good place. Thank you. I, I, it, is a, it is a challenging um, piece. How do you kind of pull out the need to know uh, progress? I mean, it's really about how are students progressing, not just getting to a certain point. And it's like if, if the, the fear is if we don't measure, do we not worry about the kids anymore you know the ones that aren't performing how, how do we continue to to make sure that um they get they get what they need and and we can't tell that if we're if we can go back and see once we start looking at things broken down by race and income there's big differences and if uh, so i'm I know it's not easy. Um, I know it's not easy and um grace for all of those that are having to go through testing um 
but I want to touch on uh, another thing that you had kind of alluded to early on, Ken, was around the post-secondary piece. And Dr. Wall, you too, like there's CTAE goes right into, you know, it's, it's between high school and technical college. And then as part of Learn for Life, it's not just about graduating high school. And mm -hmm. we've seen some initial data showing that the low-income kids are the ones not opting into college during COVID. So give us a little bit about that. Yeah, let me just give, give you some context. I mean, the, the, the systematically of this issue of, of K-12 is responsible to get kids to walk the stage to graduate high school. Post-secondary, uh, Gwinnett Tech, UGA, all these organizations are responsible to, to get the kids that are admitted across the across the stage to, to graduate so there's these there's this this gap right the, from the time the kids finish high school to the time they go into post-secondary uh, no one really owns the kid then that there there is uh that there's that there's no one that that who's held uh who, who's, whose responsibility that is directly and was, as we looked at this is something we looked at very closely at, at Warren for life and so you you think about you know high school counselors are, are kind of that person that um uh that that manages a child through that that transition who they're also doing you know uh scheduling and so, social emotional learning and some other things so it, the way it works out is the average school has about 450 kids to every uh, uh every student i'm sorry to every counselor so that that's something like 25 28 minutes per kid for the entire year and that may work for kids that have a lot of support at home and, and you know, have, a, have, have resources to help them navigate through filling out the FAFSA, choosing what school to apply to, enrolling in uh, a good uh, match and fit for, for their needs. But for, for first generation kids, uh, that's not enough. And that was before, you know, that was when they could actually wander into the counselor's office. And that, so that's not, that, that's not even happening right now. So I think it's a real challenge of, how uh, how do we keep kids, how do we support kids during this transition? That's why I mentioned before uh, some nonprofits that we work with uh, that we're very excited about, you know, One Goal, uh, College Advising Corps, um, organizations that will find kids and provide that extra support because what we see is uh, that, you know, about two thirds of kids, 70% of kids pursue some sort of uh, post-secondary enrollment, but only half those kids come back for their second year. And, and it's that persistence issue that uh, the roadblocks get in the way, financial aid gets in the way, family issues get in the way, the work is, they're not prepared academically for the work. And instead of seeking remediation, instead of seeking support, um, they end up being statistics. And so that to me is gonna be, gonna be a real challenge of how do we make sure kids are supported. Georgia State's doing, uh, doing some really heroic work around this, you know, to, uh, without using big data of if you fail your, uh, if, you get a, if you get a B minus in chemistry, uh, that's a gateway class. You may think a B minus is not so bad. They, they their data says you are you are on the wrong track. You need to you need we need to deploy resources to you right away because we see kids who get a, this grade in this class are li are less likely to be successful at the end of their first year. So we need to early intervene now. And those early those early warning systems are, are I think uh, are pretty are pretty exciting. And so those sorts of inter interventions are, can be helpful. But I think all of us have to recognize that those kids during that transition time need need additional support. So can I, I just, I want to add, how is it, can we incorporate some of those big data components that Georgia State has leveraged into K-12 and be like, okay, if you're getting a B minus in chemistry then at the high school level, then yeah. can't. Well, so, so we, uh, K-12 is doing that right now for K-12. So it, there's something called ninth grade on track which is a very common statistic. What, it's, what it basically says is if you are not on credit level, forget about grades, but if you don't have enough credits in ninth grade, then your chance of graduating, you're not going to catch up. Like you're, you're only going to fall further behind. And so we need direct intervention right away. That's one of those statistics that matters. Eighth grade algebra matters. That's something we pay a lot of attention to that if you don't have those higher order skills in math, in eighth grade, you're going to be less likely successful later on. Where the, the gap is that the, the connection between uh, uh, higher ed and K-12 is the gap because K-12 is not, at the end of the day, that's not what K-12 is held accountable to. And I'm not saying they should be because it, there's so many other, there's so much other noise in that. Uh, and CTE can be helpful because CTE is that connection to the, to the business community. And there is, there is, CTE is one of those bridges because CTE looks at employability afterwards. But I think traditional K-12, um, they're using those statistics for K-12, but not for post-secondary, not, not, not with any, not with any scale.
Okay. Dr. Wall, this transition from high school to post-secondary and the CTAE realm, give us some insights as to what you're seeing right now and from the, the class that just graduated um, earlier this year to, to this new class. Actually, Amy, I've not even had a chance to look at the data on what happened to our graduates who just graduated and where they are. That's something I need to spend some time on. Um, I would like to make a comment about our counselors. Uh, Ken mentioned the counselors and how important they are in helping students uh, get a focus and uh, decide what their career is going to be. Uh, we do need more counselors to help uh, serve our students because the ratio is, is out of whack there. Uh, our our uh, legislators, uh, I, I know, really believe that that's true and we do need more counselors. And they were very generous uh, last year by placing some more funds in the budget to uh, fund more counselors uh, in our uh, schools. However, due to the budget cuts, that money had to come out. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that's, that's just the reality. But they are seeing, too, you know, that uh, in order for the counselors to do the uh, different types of jobs that they do, the social emotional jobs, the academic jobs that they do with students, as well as that career counseling piece, we've got to have more of them. You know, we've looked at, are there other people that could serve the role of uh, providing that career piece? And uh, we put a survey out, and this was uh, mandated by our legislators, we did a survey uh, through the Carl Benson Institute with our counselors to um, find out uh, you know, why they weren't putting more focus on the career planning piece uh, than they were. And it basically boiled down to two factors. One is they need some help. They need more counselors. There's only so few of them. The other is uh, professional learning uh, and uh, the coursework that they had when they were counselors in college. Uh, there was almost, um, there, some of them may have had one course dealing with careers and uh, so we have really stepped up our game uh, when it comes to uh, engaging our counselors in professional learning about careers. We've got several business partners that have joined our efforts and we do uh, some trade talk sessions so that our counselors can understand more about careers. It's kind of hard to talk to a student about these careers when, when the knowledge base is so low. So you know, we are working in those areas to help bridge that gap to help our counselors take those results from youth science and uh, connect our students to, to careers out there. Um, you know, our, our counselors have been accused of standing in the way of students selecting certain careers. Um, and they're doing everything they can to learn more about uh, the careers that are out there so they can provide some quality guidance to our students. Awesome. Hey. Amy, this is Daniela too. Um, I know something that we've seen, and I'm sure that Dr. Wall and Ken um, have seen this as well, but you know, we really do need that strategic college and career guidance. Um, you really want to make sure that kids are getting that dedicated time to focus on college and career, especially I think to Dr. Wall's point, there are so many different careers out there. And really we want good information to kids about, you know, what are those high demand careers and what are those careers that don't have the risk of automation. If we want to prepare people for long-term you know, career development, we want to make sure that they're thinking about what their long-term growth looks like. So we want to make sure that kids are opting into careers that do have opportunities to continue to grow and learn um, and don't have that quite that risk of automation as well. Awesome. As we're, we've got about six minutes left. So um, Daniela, do we have any questions in the, in the chat box that we need to address before we kind of wrap up? We have a question from Anita about how to kind of get more wraparound services um, within districts without kind of having quite so many, um, you know, roadblocks that may pop up, especially as we're trying to keep student data safe. Um, but are there ways that we can maybe create stronger partnerships, maybe, you know, to, to Ken's point, really think about what models work in communities and how can we lift those up to have success? Hi, Daniela. This is Anita Lee. I was hoping if you'd give me a second to, to also clarify. Thank you for summing it up really good. Um, just real quickly, I served as a volunteer, uh, an investment volunteer for the United Way in Greater Atlanta. And, you know, a lot of uh, the grant funding um, that a lot of these nonprofits got were um, based on, you know, their work with schools and assisting, you know, the students um, and after school programs and other education programs. And one of the things that was always a block for the nonprofits was that, you know, there's all this, you know, 
issue with sharing data, grades, and things with the nonprofits in order to, you know, let the nonprofit prove that they that their interventions are working with those students. And I just think that, you know, if the state doesn't have tons and tons of money in order to bring on uh, counselors and things of that nature, then if they would, you know, bring in partnerships with nonprofits to provide that stop gap, but then also give them the, the option of getting that data so that they can continue to prove to their funders that they're, you know, working, you know, it might be a way to assist while we're working through this challenge of budget. I would that's a great question and uh, coming from the school district side you know school districts are hard to work with <laughs> you know I, I they they have a very set uh, set of responsibilities and uh, it, although sometimes these requests seem easy from the school district side you know there's lots of compliance lots of lots of and a lot of it, it you know all the purpose stuff is there for a reason what I would say is where, where we saw work the best is when the school district and the nonprofit are starting at the same point and that that they're working together, that nonprofits come and meet, and, and you know, and, and likely at the at the school level, not at the central office, but at the at the principal, and say, here's you know, we're here's the organization we are. We're community schools. We're 100 black men. Whatever whatever organization we are, we're boys and girls club. And what what problems can we help you solve? Because when when too often I saw nonprofits going to funders and then showing up at the school and saying, hey, we might do this thing. We'd like to do this thing. And the thing is, is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. But it's not necessarily aligned with where the school is. And, and what ends up happening, and we saw this in a lot of our, really our high needs communities, uh, you'd have um, kids going from program to program to program. They'd be talking about character education. They'd be talking about personalized learning. They'd be talking about uh, career readiness. And, you know, it, it, all these, the kids would have to try and sort all this out. Like, what's, what's the re important thing here? These things were not coherent. And so it, what I would encourage all nonprofit partners to do, and I know it's tough, is to get in front of the principal of the school and talk about develop a plan together instead of trying to do it on the back end because i think on the back end when you come and say look we're doing this stuff we would love to get data for kids principal it's hard for them to prioritize it and it may not meet their needs and i know that can be hard and it's not an easy ask but i would i would think that that partnerships at the beginning will yield uh, better returns at the end thank you ken i, I think um the partnership is key right for all of us how can we partner um together to to help all those the students through this transition and beyond once we get out of this um period of covid you know to continue to make a, a positive difference for the kids and for the employers and you know partnership with employers partnership with wraparound services partnership with our education providers and our teachers and with our legislators, it is all about partnership. So uh, great, great way to top it off here at the end. I wanna thank you both. This has been a fabulous discussion. This hour, these hours go by quickly. And it's, um, <laughs> I always worry that, oh, you know, but they, I told you guys at the beginning, I was like, if we end early, it's okay, but we never do. So um, I wanna thank you both. I, I, you guys are both pillars within the education system. And thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today. I know your calendars are full and you've got a ton of responsibility on you right now. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be with Max this morning. Um, just for everybody's benefit, we do have an event coming up next week. Um, Ken actually mentioned Amazon earlier, so we have a Max Talks event on October 21st from 12 to 1, so look for that in the um, Max Monday's email for registration, and it should already be in there, so, um, but thank you everybody, and hope you have a wonderful Friday, and we appreciate everybody joining us this morning. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Great to be with you.